Hello, today is April 1st, 2015. We're meeting today with Mr. Richard Sella at his home in Loveland, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Richard, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. Thank you. Let's start out, if we could. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you're born, a little bit about your family. Okay, I was born May 6, 1933, uh, at one of the most famous hospitals in the, in the world, John Hopkins, and um, was raised, you might say, in Baltimore, Maryland, for for till oh, I think I was 19 years old when I went into the service, and from then on, I I got out and. 1956 was working and uh, a friend of mine that I went to school with Jerry Ciparelli which who has since passed away uh, him and I ran across one another and I said Jerry what are you doing he said I'm teaching school well I had no thoughts of going to college at that time when I got out because I went back to my high school when I asked the counselor, what do I need to do, means I got VA benefits, to go to college. And she says, from your records, Richard, I don't think you can do college. Right? Uh -oh. So I put it off and I went to work for Bethlehem Steel uh, Corporation in Baltimore. And uh, when I ran across Jerry, Jerry told me I'm teaching school. And I knew I was smarter than Jerry. Shortly thereafter, I met him. I signed up to take the ACT test. And I fin finished in, back then it was percentile how you finish. And I finished in the 90% <laughs> you know, rating. And I thought, well, shoot, I could probably do college work. In high school, I was, football was my biggest love. Baseball was my best sport, but I got in touch with Bud Wilkerson because I had a, uh, offered a scholarship went out of high school. Out of high school, I went to uh, VMI. I got had a football scholarship there. And when uh, I- uh, Virginia Military Institute? Yes. Really, huh? Yeah. And the weird part about it is back then you tried out for a scholarship. You didn't, you weren't offered a scholarship because that was one, a sore point with a lot of, of coaches at that time because now you, you're asked to visit the, the campus and all that. When we went visit the campus, we scrimmaged. And if they liked what they saw, they offered you a scholarship. Well, I was offered a scholarship at Oklahoma, Kansas State, Bucknell, Hofstra. Really? And, and well, and General Marshall of the Marshall Plan, the Secretary of State, came to my house to recruit me because he was an alumni member of VMI. And my mom was all up in the air. Wow. And, so I went to VMI and here I grew up in a little Italy in Baltimore, which is a hoodlum neighborhood. And I thought to myself, here, what are you doing going to this military school? Well, I was given all kinds of reasons why. But I went there, and I thought I went on a football scholarship. Well, it was an honor system also. And back then, a freshman couldn't play football the first year. And I played under an assumed name. Oh boy. And that bothered me. Here I built myself up to think, hey, I'm gonna honor system, I'm gonna play this 100%. Well, that kind of derailed me a little bit. And I, I still went to school and everything, but after the football season, I was thought, well, I got to knuckle down and get my grades up now. Well, 
that didn't happen because I went on an athletic scholarship and they wanted me to either play basketball, wrestle, you know, or be a team manager or something of that sort, play baseball. Well, my grades were affected by all that time I was playing, playing sports. Well, before I could flunk out, I quit. And I'll never forget it. They, they accepted my resignation. And I said, how do I get home? Because I thought, I'm on scholarship. They, they was, I had to hitchhike home. Which back then, in, I'm going to say 52, well, it wasn't unusual for somebody yeah, to stop right, and sure. take you in. Here I had all my bags and all my clothes, well, which weren't a lot because I had uniforms. And when I got back, I thought, man, I'm, you know, I got to go to work. I got to, at that time, I was, what, 19? And the draft was hot. And my dad had an in with the, one of the draft board members. And he called my father and said, uh, if your son doesn't want to go in the army, you better go enlist because his name is on the next list to go out. So when my dad told me that, I said, I'm going to join the Navy. Which was funny because a friend of mine that I played football with in high school, Robert Pedrick, him and I met one another walking into the recruiting offices at the post office. And this fellow introduced himself and he was from the Coast Guard. And he said, I'd like to sign you boys up. And I said, nah, I don't want to go to the Coast Guard. I want to go to the Navy. Well, Bob Pedrick signed with the Coast Guard and he was stationed after boot camp about two blocks from where he lived in Baltimore Harbor <laughs> at the Coast Guard. But I went to Bainbridge. And I'll never forget it. The first day I go get off the bus, a fellow by, and I just saw it in the paper just this week. His name was Jim LaRue, a coach for, for Maryland. And uh, later on went into assistant coach at pro football. Well, Jim LaRue was a lieutenant, and he saw me getting off the bus. Hey, Joe, come here. And I said, what? Yeah, coach, what can I do for you? He said, you, you're coming out for football. I said, hey, I haven't even got a haircut yet, and you want me out for football. Yeah, I want you out for football. So my boot camp consisted of me going from Reveille to noon. At noontime, I went to the football barracks and practiced all afternoon. And went back to the barracks at six o'clock when everything was all over. So my boot camp was nothing but playing football. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, yeah. And Jim LaRue just died just recently. He was 89 years old. And well, I guess from there, he asked, he offered me, he said, Look, I can keep you here 100%. But he said, You'd have to go into the medical corps. I said, well, let me think about that. And then I found out that the Marines get all the medical oh, right. corps, Navy, mm -hmm. and they go in there. And I says, here, I'm joining the Navy to stay out of the Army, and I'm going to go into the Marines? <laughs> no way. So because he, Jim LaRue wanted me to stay right there at Bainbridge. And I thought, no, you know, this is an opportunity of a lifetime. I want to see part of the world. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I left Bainbridge and went to Norman, Oklahoma. And Norman, Oklahoma, and, and it's odd to say, Naval Air Station, Norman, Oklahoma, which was just south of the University of Oklahoma. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I went to school there, Airman Prep School. And to, to become a pilot, or was that a, a thought to become a pilot, or just? Just the air air part of okay. the Navy. Now, did, did, did you choose that, or did you test testing that? How did you end up there? I tested out that that was where okay. I was capable of. Okay. Okay. And, and while there, I got married with the, for the first time. Some, uh, a girlfriend from back home or someone you met there? Or how did, t talk a little, tell that story. How, uh, 
Well, it was a girl I met at, uh, in Oklahoma City. Okay. Her name was Peggy, Peggy Boyd. And we got married in April of 53 or something like that. And all went from there to Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for aviation boatsman school. Uh, from Philadelphia, we went to Point Wagu, California. Boy, it's zigzagging all over the country. Yeah. And our daughter was born there today. Oh, really? April 1st. Yeah. Oh, wow. In 55. And uh, went from Point Magoo to the USS Forstall while it was still in dry dock, while it was still being built. At, when I went there, I forget what date it was that I went, but I think it was like 55. Five or fifty-four, and anyway, they—I was the crew for one day. <laughs> was that right? <laughs> it was the captain, the executive officer, and myself. By the end of the week, we filled up one barracks. By the time we got on the ship, we had four or five barracks filled up. It was seven hundred, seven thousand five hundred guys aboard. <laughs> Jeez. Four star. And I'll never forget it. I was I went on board when we went down the shakedown cruise. And I've been on ships before, but never through that rigorous testing mm -hmm. that they do mm -hmm. with ships. And I'll never forget it. Full throttle forward to full throttle reverse and you couldn't stand up. Area oh, I was shaking. And Edward R. Merle was still on radio, and he said, if the ship tilted 45 degrees, it was going to turn over. Well, I was on the flight that when we went into hard right rudder, and we we were 80 foot above waterline, and the flight deck was taking on water. Really? Yeah. Wow. I was scared. <laughs> yeah. That was an experience, or the really experience. I think I would have re-enlisted if I could have been aboard ship operating. Because when when you were in dry dock or at anchor, anchor, it was it's an old military term, chicken. Yeah. Mm. And but when we were operating, the arresting gear officer was too old to run back and forth from the landing aircraft. Well, I took the part of the arresting gear officer. And I used to, every landing, I'd run about 15, 15 yards. And pull your brakes, up your hook, come ahead. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that must have been exciting stuff. Yes. A dangerous, pretty dangerous on the flight deck though, right? Or from what I understand? I kind of felt like it was a, a very serious football game, but if you made a mistake, somebody got killed. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and uh, one uh, one airplane snapped the cable, and I'll never forget it. It was a fellow that was standing in the catwalk, and he got his. Oh, engine. wow! Because this engine three eight cable, and got it snapped, and I'll never forget it. That pilot died, and we lost that that aircraft too, mm. because I ran to the side of the ship, and by the time I ran to the side of the ship, it was going out of sight. Mm. That was the only mishap I had in when the whole time I was on flight deck. But it, we had in those couple years that I was on there, we had must must have been all three or four thousand landings. And one mishap. Yeah, one mishap. Uh, Seeing everybody gets an idea, oh, David Air, you crashes all over. Yeah. And it doesn't happen that way. It's, mm. But it's a lot of, I think it's a lot of fun <clears throat> because it was serious. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, yeah, I really enjoyed that time. Yeah. Of, you know, life. yeah. Well, talk, talk a little bit about that, that time on, on, on the carrier. Uh, talk about what life is like 
uh, on the carrier, uh, living conditions, food, uh, what you guys did out, uh, um, you know, for when you weren't on duty, and talk about some of the places you, 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 you cruised to. Okay, well, uh, the first thing I can remember when you said that was we were the first ship to get air conditioning. Huh? And I'll never forget it. We had like 80 guys in our compartment. And out of that, I'd say 90% of us got pneumonia because they took their temperature one morning in the compartment when we were down in Gitmo Bay, and it was like 40 degrees. <laughs> you, were, you were getting up, putting on clothes, your peat coat, <laughs> to go to sleep. <laughs> but two blankets, freezing our buns up, and then go out and operate in 90 degree oh, weather. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's one thing I remember. The other thing I remember, we were first ship to have Cinerama because we could close the hangar doors and they could show the big wide screen on in the hangar deck. What else? Oh, you're sitting in, I was sitting in another comical thing. I was sitting with my chair leaning back with a cup of coffee and right on the other side of the bulkhead was the elevator. Well, the elevator is roughly 15 yards by 15 yards, pretty big. And the solenoid switch went bad. And it went, the elevator was going boom, boom. Well, that first boom, I thought for sure we had a mishap like a bomb or mm -hmm. something of that sort. And we, everybody ran out get up to the flight deck, see what was wrong. And I'll never forget it we, when we saw that it was the elevator and they fixed it and we got back into the resting gear shack and I looked and there's coffee all over the chair, my cup laying on the floor and I didn't have any on me. So all I could assume was I moved fast enough <laughs> that that coffee didn't wow. drop on me. Uh. That was... Uh, one of the fun things that happened there. And I'll never forget, we had two chow halls. And they served 7,500 guys at each meal. Yeah, it's just a floating city is what it is. Yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 Never got, never got from my quarters were just below the flight deck. So that was roughly about the old four level. Flight deck was old five level. And we went up five more with the superstructure. So we had 10 flights above Jeez. main deck and 10 flights below the main deck. It, it's just fun to talk about it for a simple reason. It was, we were flabbergasted as young kids, you know. Yeah, sure. Uh, when we went full throttle with that four stall, and it was classified at that time, it sat down like a motorboat. Going 80,000 tons, like 100 feet short of a quarter of a mile long. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's surprising what that ship could do. Wow. Uh. The other thing was that, that was surprising was the steam cats, because the steam catapult and the arresting gear crew were kind of in the same uh, division. And I remember going up there when we didn't have any. Uh, landings coming in, walking up and just observing because that was part of my MO anyway, resting gear and catapults. And to see the steam catapults when we were in dry dock, I remember we took on a, a big, the only way to describe it was a dead load with wheels, with an airplane wheels on it. Big though, real big. And we, I think it was 350,000 pounds of dead load. We put water into this big, and they fired that thing off, and it landed like 150 yards out in front of the boat. <laughs> and the capacity of the steam cat was, you put it on the catapult, and we'll launch it. Wow. Yeah, it was something to see, uh -huh. man. And then when we were out, you know, for our, forget what the name is, went through my head. Our break, 
being able to qualify for to be a ship and everything, you had to do something like all oh, ten airplanes in the air in fifteen minutes or something like that, or it was less than that. It was really close quarter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anyway, that that was one of the the fun things to do. Again, serious stuff and everything had to be just right. What I was really appalled at was every time we fired this one particular aircraft, the bridle that was hooked up for the catapult just <laughs> fell off because it was so heavy that it would rip the, the bridle catcher off. It would rip it off of the ship. So they were just deep six in it. Hmm. Another thing, I'm, I'm scrambling around in my head, but I yeah. hope that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. The, one of the things I was known for board ship, the captain up in pre-flight, we had a, a, a cable that was not meeting specification. If you had three breaks in a cable roll, in other words, you start here and you went around one time, you had three break, breaks in that cable row, you had to deep six it, put a new cable. And I never forget, we got in to one of the times and and we had to do it. So we had to pull the tractor out, and pull the cable and then unhook it and get the new one. Remember, captain said, Joe, how long are you gonna be down there? So, Cause I'm, shoot, a couple of blocks away from mm -hmm. city blocks. <laughs> so about an hour later, you know, how long are you gonna be here? So I had the nickname of two minutes. <laughs> and that's it's a lot more than it looks like, you know, for inch and three eighths cable, a lot of cable, everything had to be done with tractor. Mm. And then after you got them all up, the swedge fittings that they had on, for every bit of this, you know, and, and just to get it done. And then after we got it hooked up again, the old one just over the time. Hmm. So, that's why I guess the, one, one of the things I'm leaving out, I started playing baseball for the ship's team. And we, we, had, we were the Atlantic Fleet's championship baseball team. And we played, we were playing against bases. Oh, that okay. we were that good. Uh -huh. Well, we had a lot to choose from. Uh -huh. And I'll never forget it. I, with pride, I had a base hit off of Johnny Padres that was pitching for the Dodgers at the time. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and I was a catcher. And after, all right, I was, when, when I got out of service, I was signed by Cincinnati. And this is the team that I signed with. Uh, one of their farm teams? Yes. Uh -huh. Savannah Sand Nats. And just this past year, was down there for my wife's sorority convention, or get together for, with her class, her pledge class. And a friend of mine and I went to the ball game in, in Savannah. And got to talking with the groundskeeper and all that. They made a big deal out of it. The president of the company came down, I mean, the ball club came down took me out to the field and took pictures and all that. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he said, well, we don't have any record of you being, you know, being here. But he said, uh, we, we know you, you knew about us and everything. He said, what do you find strange about the, fly, the ballpark looks the same. Huh. But I said, I'm a catcher. And I look at that left field, that left field is a lot further than I remember it. And the guy says, you played here because 10 years ago, we moved that uh. back. And that was one of the thrills that I had this past year at summer vacation. Wow, oh, wonderful story. Uh, uh. They gave me the hat and they took a picture and put it in in their ball, in their ball game, you know, things of that sort. Uh. I guess I'm to the point where, I'll tell you, I went back to school so well, let's let's finish out your your Navy career, and then uh, okay. and then we'll move on to your post post uh, military. 
you, you talked about get, uh, uh, cruising down the Gitmo. Where are some of the other cruises you took uh, through uh, through your career, your, your time on the on the carrier? Well, I the one that most sailors don't particularly like. We did a lot of North Atlantic. Oh boy! Oh, you know, and here, eighty thousand ton ship was bouncing oh. around like a cork. Oh boy! <laughs> and I'll never forget. I was okay, okay. I didn't have any problems with seasickness or anything of that sort. But I was in Chow Hall, re e eating, and the guy right across from me had a projectile, and that set me off. And then for about two or three days, I did nothing but. Ugh. Uh. <laughs> yeah. But that that was one of all oh, a good experience also, I think. Because it, it gave you an idea of what power that that ocean has. Mm, mm. And you don't realize we were taking water with waves over top of the flight deck and and I told you we were eighty foot above water line. It just that you don't have any imagination that it's yeah. something like that. Yeah. Well, that happened during a, a hurricane. And if you know Navy, if you have a hurricane or something like that, all the ships go out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we went out, and I was in a hurricane that, that happened. And rain, oh, you know, really no rain until you've been in a hurricane. Uh, for Point Magoo was kind of, that was before the forest all, uh, right out of uh, aviation boats and school in Philadelphia, and I just got a missile base. And back then I was seeing things that now we talk about, and we had back then. And I, I never forget it, I was on duty one night and we had a, one of those, I forget the names of them, but SB-70E, one that, this plane went so fast, this was in 53, 54, when it landed, all the lights were turned out, and this plane was glowing. I read about it later, and if they were on final approach to go into California, it took 15 minutes to go from from the East Coast to the West Coast. Wow. And I, I think to this Is this day, one of our spy planes? Or was it... Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because you you're you you're talking, you're, we're in the thick of the Cold War now. I, you know, yes. tail end of the Korean War, and now we're in yeah. the thick of the Cold War with the Soviets. And, yes. Yeah. And that, and I thought, I think to myself now, and when I talk to people, well, really, where, uh, hey, the United States has got things that you don't even know about. Mm, mm. And that was a very oh, enlightening deal for me for the simple reason that uh, seeing that kind of secret kind of stuff and seeing some film of how a drone, we would put up a, a full airplane drone back then and, you know, another pilot flying it and they'd do crazy things and they'd fire a missile and it'd just follow that. And it, we, we did that once a month when we blew up an airplane. Hmm. And then, that was a very, very interesting, my first, first experience with an earthquake was on a point to go. Talking to a buddy, I was waiting for a buddy that went into to the head, and I was leaning against a concrete hanger, and all of a sudden it moved. What the heck? It looked out across the field, and the field was, you know, waving. <laughs> and the, there's a mountain at the end of the runway. This was Coast 101, or Cape Coast One. 101 and the mountain was moving and I, I, my buddy come running out he thought he was dying because the, the stool was starting to move <laughs> while he was on the job but that, that after a while in california he you just take him as it's huh. nothing huh. 
when I, that was that was that prior to prior to going on the on the on the forestall yeah forestall okay yeah my my sequence and I thought about it after you gave me this question here is Bainbridge Norman Oklahoma Point Magoo forestall and then I got out okay yeah. and I was one of the first guys to ever get out and not get transferred back to a base. I got I got discharged from the USS Forestall. And that was unheard of back then. Oh, a lot of firsts sound like you were the, the very, the initial, original first crewman of the Forestall. Is that, yes. I mean, that was the way it would work out. I mean, yeah. wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, 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 with pride, somewhere in, is I have my plank owner, I have a, you know, in the Navy, if you're the original crew, uh -huh. you get a plank owner certificate. Okay. I've also got my Neptune. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you guys crossed the equator. Talk uh, about that. <laughs> that ceremony is always the. Well, what I was, I really thought, hey, this is great. The, not the executive officer, but the officer that was in charge of resting gear had never been across the equator. And he was like uh, all, had about 10 years in the, in the service, and he had to go through just like the rest of us. <laughs> and the only, the only thing that I, I didn't, nothing bothered me, getting ketchup thrown all well, over well, me. Tell, all. Talk about the ceremony for those that will watch us, that, I mean, it, it, just what you went through. I mean. all, raw eggs just cracked on your head, and you know, olive oil, and uh, <laughs> tomatoes all squashed up, and, just slop, yeah. so to speak. And you had to crawl through it. And all there's, the a, there's a tunnel that you had to crawl yeah, through with, that, yeah, go with through all the tunnel, trash yeah. and stuff in it, yeah. But the worst thing of all was lard. They took the fattest guy on board ship, put lard on his belly, and you had to kiss his belly. <laughs> but everybody had to go through it, uh -huh. you know. Uh -huh. And I, I, I'd never forget some guys, you know, would say, I'm not going to go through that. Yeah. They had to go through it. <laughs> and this officer that was in charge of us, he, he had to go through it. But now you can say, well, I crossed the equator yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. And you hear the scuttlebutt that, that you know, you could see the line when you walk on the ship in the water, it would be a line. <laughs> yeah, just pulling your chain. Yeah, uh -huh. What were some of your favorite ports of call? Uh, I mean, you said you, you joined the Navy to, to experience it. Talk about uh, some of your favorite ports. Uh, did you have any favorite ports or favorite locations? Uh, I didn't do too much traveling. Oh, really? Yeah. Other, than, other than, you know, in the United States. And then, oh, I remember going to Gitmo. When we were at Gitmo, was when we, were, we formed a baseball team and everything mm -hmm. of that sort. But I had a, the opportunity to go to the Dominican Republic and see that Tradillo, and also to Havana. That was well before Castro, hmm. and and we visit you know the port of Havana, and we were anchored way out. And, and never forget that that night I had the duty, and I was walking around the ship, and this guy drunk as a skunk. <laughs> And he said, I'm going to, I'm going to swim back in there. I said, hey, you can't do that. Come on, get in there. Well, I grabbed him away from the, going over. He was going to just dive over the ship. And later on, I found out he did. And he, they lost him at sea. Really? Huh? Yeah. Uh, that was one of the tragedy things. Yeah, yeah. I think it's an experience of going through getting supplies where a supply ship comes alongside and yeah, yeah. throw a line across and taking on supplies and all that kind of stuff. Oh uh, yeah, that's always fascinated me too, that whole procedure. Yeah. And fueling. Yeah. Fueling the same thing. Yeah. Uh, we I was before, way before the forest all had the, the tragedy of mm -hmm. the fire for it. Right, right. And I was kind of surprised when I heard that the ship was retired. And 
never forget one of the fun things that we, I remember. Our compartment was, you know, you don't have any windows. And one of the things we used to do on a weekend, somebody would be sleeping and go through the whole compartment and say, hey, can we go? Joe over here. Well, everybody turn out the lights, you know, and everybody would get undressed. And then, hey, Joe, come on, get up. It's time to go to work. What time is it? It's Monday morning, come on. And the guy would go in and shower and all that, get dressed and go down. He'd go down, to, it's like he was going to chow. We would change the cock in the compartment. Change, and he'd go down and get, to get in line for chow and every be daytime. And he'd come back and <laughs> But it was pulled on me and I fell for it. <laughs> you know, never forget it. Shit. Saying it doesn't feel like I need a shave. Yeah, shave and you know, didn't think about it. And, and then you come back and everybody was laughing, you know, you got <laughs> uh, uh, something outstanding. One of the things I, I really was shocked at is some of the training we had to go through when uh, in boot camp. Uh, my first experience of tear gas. Oh boy. Yeah, and that kind of stuff. And later on, uh, when I was that was when we were, we were in, oh, Anchor in Norfolk. And I was deemed a, an instructor for a firefighting, shipboard firefighting. And I got assigned for a month working at, in Bainbridge, not in Bainbridge, in Norfolk, teaching uh, Orientals how to, uh, Japanese, how to, how to do shipboard firefighting, and I'll never forget it. No, it wasn't that boy. It wasn't Japanese, Chinese. Really? Yeah. Huh. And we were teaching them how to uh, shipboard firefighting. How did that come together? I mean, because we were, I mean, what, like I said, once again, in the middle of the Cold War, you know, that was China Red. What were we doing? Well, we had, we had, Ori they might not have been Chinese, hmm. but they were Oriental. I didn't hmm. understand them at oh, okay. all. But you, You've heard the term Chinese fire drill. It is hilarious. Hilarious. Those guys get excited and it's <laughs> and a little bit of flames and it bows anybody. You see that much flames and you've got to go into a compartment. It's it's kind of scary. Yeah, yeah. But that I guess it, it was after a while I was I was an instructor for a lot of stuff because I had had the schooling to fix the arresting gear. I had none of the kids that I was with knew anything about the arresting gear and I had schooling on it. So I would have to reach in and do repairs and everything. And a lot of people don't realize what is entailed and how big those arresting gear machines are. Mm. And when one of them gets, when a wire gets hit that's hooked to that machine, it sounds like two pieces of metal being ripped apart. Wow. Yeah, and the accumulator, every bit of oh, four foot, five foot diameter, and a piston going through that, and then a reading system this is the way they stop those airplanes. Hmm. Wow. And if like our board ship, the Forstall, number three was the most favorite, you know, wire for, you know, for airplanes to catch. And after a while, that, you, the guy that was assigned to that compartment to watch everything that it was going all right, would have to get out, get out of it, and open the door, and let, stay outside because it would get red hot. From wow. you being hit, wow. and Forstall was one of the first to all initiate a British invention of they had a forklift with a concave 
mirror on it and measured up the deck, went down the deck and there was three, I don't want to say this now, no. Well, anyway, it was green lights on both sides of the mirror. Green, green lights? Yeah, green lights. Red light up top of the mirror. And it measured up the deck in a certain angle with the, the concave mirror. A plane would come around final approach and just center the four yellow lights with the three, the six green lights. And as long as he kept it centered, perfect landing. Hmm. Well, how? Now, if he, LSO, the land signaling officer, if he looked like he was out of sync, press the button and the three lights went off and he had to go around. It was just phenomenal. I was fortunate enough to have a ride. Oh, really? Oh, wow. On a seven, F7U. A thing you used to call it Crusader. It had a, a 10 foot nose wheel. The plane landed like, like this. Huh. And flying with it, it was good for 45 minutes. But it did in excess of 2,000 miles an hour. Back in, this is talking 53, 54, and that was just unheard of. Nobody knew we had anything like that. And I'll never forget, I was sitting in, in the jump seat with the pilot and had the screen in front of me. See that blip? The yeah. So that's the, the ship. He said, that's about 50 miles from here. And we were going by. I mean, in no time flat. Go on. <laughs> and the sea coming around, you, you when you're aboard the ship, you don't see it moving yeah, right, any. Yeah. But you get around and you're landing on it, and you see that thing move. <laughs> it, it's just a miracle how they yeah, right. land those aircraft. Right. And it, it, that was a fun part of my Navy experience. I'll bet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, how was it? Were you guys were stationed out of Norfolk then? And yeah, that, the ship and, was. And yeah, its home port was Norfolk. So the family would stay behind. Was that tough going on on cruises and being apart from the family? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think I guess when I got aboard ship, my wife and the kids were, well, one child, uh, our daughter, uh, six months. Huh. We were apart. Wow. While we were on shakedown and all yeah. that, then when we come back, when we got back, it, Norfolk was going to be our home port. Well, then I had moved my wife from Baltimore down to Norfolk, and that's when our son was born in Norfolk, or I shouldn't say Norfolk, Portsmouth, Virginia, and that was July 21st of '56. So, hmm. both of my kids are Planned Parenthood. Both <laughs> <laughs> Each one of them cost five dollars and twenty-five cents, and we had to pay for something that, that was not covered with the navy. Uh, so uh, your enlistment was a, what a four-year enlistment then, or what? Uh... I, I put four years, and then I went back in for a month. They asked me to come back in, in a, for a month to see how the uh, it was called station guard guard station guard or something like that and it was at NAS Norfolk and I went back for a month and they they tried to recruit me to come back in and by then I I was pretty much established in a as a firefighter at the airport in Baltimore at that time it was called Friendship Airport now it's called BW BWI yeah. yeah but uh, I that's where I got I thought about it real a whole lot, but the wife at that time uh, said she didn't want any more parts of that yeah, being yeah, on. Yeah. And so I I did not take advantage of it, but I would have thought I think about it now and I would have been retired fifty years. Or <laughs> but it it was fun the other way too. Yeah. So you got out and, and went to work as a firefighter there at the airport? Well, I started at Bethlehem Steel. Okay. Then got the job at, at the airport and then went went to the airport. And uh, 
stayed at the airport for oh, four or five years. And that's when I took the ACT test and uh, called Bud Wilkerson. And I said, look, I'm, I'm almost 30 years old, uh, but I'd like to be able to play football. And he said, well, I got an assistant coach up at that area and he'll put you through some drills and we'll see. Well, they offered me a job or they offered me a scholarship. And I said, uh, great. Well, in March, March 63? Yeah, March of 63, I uh, had an automobile accident. I should have got killed. Oh, wow. Um, 150 mile an hour impact. I was going 50 miles going east, going turnpike around Baltimore City and an escaped convict with a stolen car running from the police hit me. Head on? Almost. He's coming up the wrong side of an uh, interstate highway and the last thing I remember is saying, what is that dumb son of doing on the wrong side of the road? And that's the last thing I remember. Oh. All the ribs on his side were, were broken. A spleen was ruptured half of my stomach, 15 pints of blood, and this is the only thing I got on the outside. And should have been, like I say, should have been killed. Uh, but I had a death experience, and I saw the Lord. I was walking steps, and you've heard of and the death experience long hallway, started climbing steps and big majestic voice said, stop son, go back. I have other things for you to do. Well, I really, really took that to heart. Became religious, not, not so much for my sake when I first started back to church was for my kids. If I'm gonna be a father, I have to set a good example. I'm gonna to go to church. Well, then I got hooked. And I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm retired clergy. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. I'm an Episcopal clergyman or deacon and went through ordination. It took me 14 years to do it because at the time I had a landscaping company, Charles Lawn and Garden, and I couldn't just see dropping that and my family's yeah. counting on me to feed them. Yeah. And I studied for, for orders. In other words, I took Hebrew, I took Latin, I took, you know, all on my own. And then I had to take a canonical test at the end of that all that to be ordained. And I passed it with flying colors. So I always thought. So, so with the accident, uh, that ended any aspiration to go into college. There did. Yes. Okay. No, the accident. I still went to college. Oh, you did. I called, and that was when Bud Wilkinson resigned, and Gomer Jones is number one assistant took over, and he said, Richard, he says, we'll find something for you to do, but you're not going to be able to play football yeah, anymore. Yeah. So I said, well, great. I'm glad you, you know, you're still, I got tuition and, and books. And went back and I was a student coach for oh. three years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Defensive backfield coach. And uh, was also all the scouts for the team that we were playing the next week. Okay, uh-huh. A guy by the name of Homer Rice was on the staff at OU at that time. Jim McKenzie was the coach, uh, number one assistant from Arkansas. Second year he had a heart attack and died. And the name just went through. He, he was here as head coach too. He also head coach at, for the Patriots. Oh yeah, I know who Chuck you're- Chuck Fairbanks. Yes, yeah. Chuck Fairbanks was the coach, finally. <laughs> and 
he was terrible. A great coach, terrible. Hooray for me, screw you. Yep. And I, I had quit uh, after his second year. I was a senior anyway, and I quit with him and went to work for the city of Norman as a recreation director. My last year in school, I was working full time and going to school full time. With a family. With a family. Yeah. Oh, family man. too. <laughs> yeah. Needless to say, my wife worked also. But by then I got GI Bill and was getting paid that way. And we were staying in Mary student housing. A real coincidence. The barracks that I was stationed in when I was in Norman is the same barracks that married student housing had. Huh. And my bunk, where my bunk was, was where our apartment was. Really? Huh. We had a three bedroom, two bath apartment in that barracks that they had converted. And my bunk was located in that same oh, area. I'll be darned. Yeah. Huh. And that's, I think that's one of those God experiences that I had. Mm. Yeah. Uh, going through the, the stuff that I had to go through with, with studying was something else. Working full time. Yeah, and, right. And went to classes most of the time at night or worked it in my schedule. There were times I went to work with, with I mean, went to school with work clothes on. And like I said, it took 14 years. I was made a postulant in 77 and got ordained 91. Wow. Man. Enjoyable though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I enjoy it to this day. My, most of my ministry was with prisons. Okay. Yeah. And uh, really, really liked it but was also naive. After a while, though, I became pretty hard. Uh, when I first went there, guys would say, hey, can you bring us some cigarettes? Well, no. And then, you know, I was definitely out. And here I'm going to prison with a collar on. The first time I went, went with the bishop of Colorado, Bishop Winterow, and <laughs> we had to strip down and I thought, gee, if they have to get the bishop to strip down, they, they're not taking his word that he's okay. It's pretty serious. And it was serious. Uh, um, I had to, to sometime judge, yay or nay, for this guy to go into this halfway house that, that the Diocese of Colorado was mm -hmm. sponsoring. And there were a lot of times that I, I thought, man, I really don't. But we had like three guys went all the time. And if it wasn't unanimous, all three of us had to interview this particular guy. All three of us had to be unanimous, good or bad. Now, one out of three, two out of three, no. Mm -hmm. he, they failed. Mm -hmm. And we ran a, a halfway house in Denver called Dismas House. And I did that for oh, quite a few years. Hmm. I was the chaplain for that hmm. particular group. I, if you would have asked me out of high school, did I have the smarts to go to college? I would have said no, because I was a cut up. No, I didn't really take school serious. But a fellow by the name of George Wilcox senior chemistry teacher. I will never forget walking in his room, he grabbed me by the shirt, banged me up against the wall. This guy was big. He played for Princeton. He was a tight end. And he banged me against the wall and he said, Mr. I heard you're a cut up. You're gonna work in my class. Straight A student. Is that right? Straight A. I that and then 
when I went to Norman in the service, I t you remember this was, I think all the services had it. You took a second year equivalency test, and I had got enough smarts by going to VMI and just being naturally smart. Yeah, right. I passed it first time, second year, I had two year equivalency school. Well, they wanted me to go think about being a pilot and couldn't pass the physical. Even though I thought, man, my eyes are great. I could pass the eye exam, mm, could pass mm. a couple things physically. You know, and, but that was uh, an experience I got from the Navy. That I was pretty intelligent. And my grade point when I got out of college was 3.5. Really? Wow. Yeah. So, and I was valedictorian of my class. Probably could have been higher. I mean, but you, I mean, you were working, you had a family. I mean, you had, it wasn't like you were just concentrating entirely on your studies, so. Very yeah. true. Yeah. Very true. But, again, my first wife, that's one of the things she had against me was the fact that every weekend I was in the library. The way I felt, I didn't feel like I was intelligent enough to go to college, and I had to put the time. Mm, mm. If it didn't come to me naturally, then I had to put the time in. Kids that were I, I was going to school with at the time, here I'm 29, yeah. they looked up to me, and they came to my house to study, and they they thought I was, you know, the cat's meow. I was an A student in anatomy, an A student in physiology, an A student in physiology exercise, kines. What did you get your undergraduate degree in? Education. Education, okay. Yeah. I was going to be a teacher. And after one year or practice teaching, I thought, they, if I stay in this field, I'm either going to have to change my personality or I'm going to go to jail because the kids were disrespectful yeah. and I was a hands-on guy. Ah, uh, right, yeah. yeah. And I never forget it. The friend, when I was going through practice teaching, one of the guys that I hired as a coach during the summer because I was head of the recreation department, he was the vice principal. Well, I come out, of, I was in the classroom, biology, and I come out and I said, Jerry, come on, get in here, the bell's ring. And he gives me the best four letter word, you. And I had him, Roger shirt, you know, and, and this guy came around the corner just then and grabbed me off of him and said, you can't be doing that. And I thought, this is not for me. I can't do this. So I've done all kinds of things, of, you know, that didn't pertain to my right. education. Right. I taught school, what, two years? And one of those years was when I was doing my master's work and I was a uh, student professor or mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and I taught at Oklahoma and got a master's in physiology exercise. Really? Yeah. Wow. So, and I got a physio uh, theology, a master's in theology. Pretty good for a high school kid that was a cut up and didn't think he was very smart. Boy. Yeah. Yeah. And most of that I did on my own too. Yeah. Yeah. So you, and then eventually with that, that accident uh, got you into the ministry. That took you 14 years. Then how long? You started in 91, and then how long altogether were you in the ministry then? Uh, from two, well, from 1991 to 2000, it's only been, what, four years? Four years ago. About 2011, something like that. So 20, then, 20 years then. Yeah, it was 20 years right on the button, I think. Uh, my again, my bishop was called me. I was at a meeting with him, and he said, "Richard, come here." Said, yes, sir. What can I do for you? He said, "Do you read the canons of the church?" And I says, "Oh, sometime." 
you know, being truthful with him. Yeah. And he said, do you ever read the canon that says, all bishops, priests, and deacons shall retire at the age of 72? I said, no, I don't know that one at all. He says, well, you're over that age, and I would like for your resignation on my desk in the morning. So I had to resign. Huh. Now, I could still perform, but not on a regular basis. What was the reasoning behind uh... That's the canon law says 72, yeah. You shall I mean, there's just a, a lot of wisdom lost there, or, you know. It... I, that's the way I felt, too. Yeah. But the priest that I serve under, right down the street from you, St. Albans, uh -huh. Rex Chambers, I go to church with him, and I perform quite a few quite a few sometimes. I'm not supposed to, but he's okay with it. I'm okay with it. Huh. So, as long as the bishop doesn't find out, I'm all right. Huh. Hmm. Uh, and I'm not really breaking anything really morally wrong. I, I've done a, the latest thing I did was a, a wedding for a friend of ours in St. Louis. And a funny thing happened during that ceremony. It was my mode of operation was I, when we got to the point, I was going to take you and I, I tell them in a whispering way, please repeat after me. And he said, please repeat after me. <laughs> Broke up the whole, had to stop, I was laughing so hard. <laughs> Of course, in practice, I even told him, I said, yeah. I'm going to whisper to you, but I want you to speak very loud because they're not here to see me, they're here to see yeah. you. Okay. <clears throat> and here he comes out of, please repeat after me. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. And that, that was the last time I really did anything official. Yeah. That wedding. Yeah. yeah. Plus, you, you'd be surprised at all the stuff that you have to go through. My first wedding was a friend of ours that lives in California, Patty, and she was living in Albuquerque at the time. And she says, I want you to do my wedding. And I said, well, let me see what I can do and I'll get back to you. So she gave me a year's notice. I had to get permission, first of all, from my bishop to go to Albuquerque. Had to get the permission from the bishop in Albuquerque to do it. Then I had to get the permission from the state, to, and permission from, <laughs> and it took a year. We were sh short, maybe. Uh, we got the final okay for everything in nine or ten months. Wow. Yeah. Mm. And I'll, it was at Anderson's Vineyard. Well, I picture I've never been to Albuquerque, and I could picture a nice hill filled with great vines and all that. Got there, it was a glorified garage. <laughs> now, had a had a little nice hut that was, where the tasting and everything took place. And we got on, you might say, a concrete slab. We put up a trellis with some flowers and all that. But my, when I first saw it, I thought, man, this is nothing that I visualized. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, we, that was our first wedding. Hmm. But it was—it it sounds like it was a wonderful career, though, that you had uh, in the yeah. ministry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did some things. One of my gifts, though, is healing. And a uh, gal by the name of Marlene Bennett that lives in Portland, Oregon. And she had cancer of the colon and was supposed to die. This was, I'm going to be exaggerating low and say 10 years ago at least, or more like 20 years ago. And I was praying over and anointed her and everything. And I felt drained, like I had done a full day's work or ran a marathon after it. That's when I knew that 
the Lord was working through me. She's leaving today. Now that's only happened to me a couple times. Uh, one time I was praying over a fellow that very unusual had a stroke and I went in and he wasn't really bad from the stroke and I was praying for him and after I got done I was away from him and I got a message uh, it's time for Dick Fitzgerald to go and I cried like a baby well thinking about it now Choked up. Uh, Dick died of something that's very seldom I very seldom heard. He had had a stroke. He was still in the hospital. A month later, he had a heart attack and died. Mm. Mm. But that was that was one. Of, that's well. That's the roller coaster of ministry too. Yeah, right. And I served under a priest. Father Rod Moore at St. Stephen's in Aurora. Rod didn't like to do last rites. So I did a lot of last rites. Oh, I guess appropriately because I knew the people. I grew up from that congregation. And uh, that was always tough on me, really tough. And I, I would dream myself after doing the last rites. One, Margaret Putnam had three sons. All three of them were CIA. And came to me at, uh, at her funeral and said, I um, mean, not at her funeral, she was dying, and, and said, uh, we would like for you to do the last rites. Mom would want that because I was calling on her I called on her for about 10 years. I brought her communion and that kind of thing. And, and uh, never forget it. I was praying over in the last rites. I was holding her hand. And I said, Margaret, save me a seat at the banquet. And she squeezed my hand. So I knew she heard me. Uh -huh. But she was in a coma, had been in a coma for two weeks wow. and they wanted me to be there when they pulled the plug and she lived 10 minutes yeah. after that. Hmm. But I, I've had a rich, rich and uh, glorious life. It sounds like it, yeah. yeah. Well, well, we'll, we'll, we'll start to wind down this interview, but uh, one, one aspect we haven't talked about is talk a little bit about family and, and then we'll, we'll slowly wind down the interview. Okay, Jess, when I just told you when you came in, we got a new grandson. That makes thir 13, 13 grandkids. Wow. We've got three great grandkids. Um, my son is where is responsible for six of them uh, and I told him I said if you don't get a bisectomy I'm going to give you a bisectomy <laughs> he lives in Granby Colorado that's the bunch that's right in the middle there's five right down there uh -huh. yeah and we don't have the oldest one Lewis that just recently came back into the family it was my, my son's first wife Okay. And uh, they divorced, and Lewis, uh, for some reason or another, went and changed his name to his stepfather. Mm -hmm. Well, he just recently, when I say recently, last weekend, called and said he wants back in our family. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be together this coming Saturday at my daughter's 60th birthday. And uh, that was real, real surprise and a real, um, all glorious. Sure, time. sure. The two kids that you see under the group family, mm -hmm. that's our two great grandkids. Uh, my 
granddaughter Katie, that's her too, and she is my daughter's daughter. Okay. And the great, the other great grandkid is one of the step grandchildren. His wife just had a baby. And I'm on my second marriage. Okay. Mary and I have been married 28 years. Mary's with me. I got a divorce in 85. And I, at the time, I was going to class and everything, studying. And I said, what if I want to just sell my company and go to seminary? Uh, how do you feel about this? This is before we got married. And she says, when do we leave? Mm -hmm. And I knew I had a winner. And this marriage is what marriage was all was supposed to be about. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a very good husband or father at that time. Because my idea of a father was provide for your kids all those things that you didn't get when you were younger. And when I worked as a fireman, I worked one day on, one day off, 24 on, 24 off. On a 24 off, I would work 16 hours fueling aircraft. So I was never home. You know, and even, you know, I'd come weekends, every, when you work at the airport, holidays don't mean anything. So I, my kids very seldom saw me. But they, I must have done something wrong because they want to be close to me. Okay. My daughter lives in Denver. My son lives in Grammy. And uh, they want to be close by. Good. Yeah. Now, my ex-wife had passed away last year. She was, what, 78? Or a couple years ago, I should mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and we were, on, we were on speaking terms at that time. She was really upset with me because she saw some of the rough side of me. And she didn't see me being ordained whatsoever. Mm. And to this day, she, when she died, she was not a part of the Episcopal Church. She was part of the Lutheran Church. I was born and raised, you know, Italian. I was born and raised Catholic. And even at a young age, I questioned, how come we listen to one guy, a pope? I only listen to one guy, God. And uh, that questioning and birth control and a couple other things didn't really agree with the Catholic Church and the Episcopal Church. I agree with just about everything. Although I do, do not make statements anymore with the Episcopal Church because I thought when we started the first female thing. I, uh, don't worry, I'll never see a female priest. Well, that happened. And then I said, well, I'll never see a female bishop. That happened. I'll never see a homosexual be a bishop. That happened. Presiding bishop, female. That happened. So I don't say any kind of things like that anymore. Because we don't, we don't know. Yeah. Our church, though, here in the diocese, is slowly becoming a female church. Uh, if you ask me, what's the percentage right now? It's pretty close to fifty-fifty, female and male. The reasoning being, and it's a shame. Females will work for less money. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that should not be. Yeah, yeah. You know, if I'm going to do the same work, uh, a female's going to do the same job as I'm doing. She ought to get paid the same thing yeah. I'm getting paid. Plus, I, I really have gone 180 degrees. I didn't think females should be uh, a priest. But one thing I 
definitely you'll argue with anybody with it. They are better at nurturing than a male is. I just don't think it's part of our DNA as a male mm -hmm. to be a real, we can care for people and everything else, but nurturing is a kind of different word, so to speak, that we're just not built that way. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really helped the Episcopal Church. And I think, show them a prejudice, I, I think the Catholic Church would be a lot better off if they have female clergy. Yeah. And I, just because we had 12 apostles that were all male, doesn't mean that there weren't females involved. Yeah. And the t times are changing. Things need to be changed. Yeah. Right now, I'm, I'm, I guess, one of the things I'm trying to bring you to, to today. One, I'm very comfortable where I'm at. I am got all kinds of medical problems, but almost 82. Most of the fellows that I grew up with are gone. I had eight buddies, eight of us. They were all within six months age-wise. Three of us are left. Mm -hmm. The thing that I'm most proud about though, out of those eight, five of us have college degrees. Three of us have advanced degrees. And if you were to ask that when we were growing yeah. up, no way. And we thought we were going to change all our neighborhood because we, dope dealers, you know, you name it, it was there. And I was just back there just recently and it's still the same way. Mm -hmm. the, the kids don't see any any way that they can get out of doing something legal and be able to get ahead. And that's a shame. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. Well, it sounds like it's been a, a wonderful life to, to date. Uh, is there anything as we, as we start to wind down here, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about or any of the stories that kind of floated to the top that you wanted to talk about? Or do you think by and large, we kind of more or less covered your, uh, your story, it, it got it as best we could. I think we covered just about everything. Yeah. I'm trying to get some clues. Now, yeah, uh, one of the things, I think that my ex-wife did a heck of a job raising the children, but uh, I was definitely disciplinary. You know, mm -hmm. your father will take care of you. No. Yeah. And that's why I, I made a statement. I said I was a terrible husband and terrible. My idea of providing for my family was the number one point. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that was 100% wrong. Your presence is more valuable than you ever think about it. Uh, I preach this with people that I'm training to call on adults. Communion is very important to those people. Not as important, I think, as presence and listening. I think that is a, as important, if not more so, than bringing them communion. Because I've seen that through experience. And some of the, some of the times that, that is really tough to go through because it's not, if it's all going to think how you look at it. It could be very boring. But if you're genuinely interested in that person you're talking to, and listening, not talking, listening. It's very enriching. Mm -hmm. That's the good part of ministry. Mm -hmm. The bad part of ministry is the deaths and the sickness and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Well, I think that's a good point to, to end on. Um, I wanna thank you for sitting down today to tell your story. Uh, just as important though, I wanna thank you for your service to our country. Thank you.
Thank you.